All right, well, welcome everyone to this panel discussion and recognition of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, and as part of this panel, we'll be exploring the impact of COVID-19 on screening and care for breast cancer patients around the globe and the ongoing needs uh, in breast cancer and the importance of ongoing innovation. I'm very pleased for this particular panel to have three distinguished guests join me. But before I turn it over to our panelists, I did want to take a minute to share some key statistics. The U.S. has seen a fall of 52 percent in breast cancer diagnoses during the pandemic relative to uh, the statistics that we saw prior to the pandemic. NHS England has reported a 57 percent decline in urgent GP referrals for suspected breast cancer. In addition, GP referrals, surgery, reconstructive surgery, fertility preservation, follow-up supportive care, and clinical trials have all been dramatically impacted by COVID-19. And over recent months, we've seen a significant impact of COVID-19 on breast cancer, particularly in terms of regular screenings and on mammograms. Dr. Simcock, what has your experience been over the recent months in terms of the impact of COVID-19 on diagnoses and on testing rates uh, in the patient population that you've seen? Well, the figures that you gave ring very true. Uh, the screening program that brings in a large number of our early diagnoses, our most curable cancers, all but came to a halt in the UK. And that's made a huge difference to the number of cases that are coming through our surgical units. And in the early stages of the pandemic, uh, the women presenting with symptomatic breast cancers were also uh, at a very low level. I'm pleased to say that those numbers are starting to resemble the kind of activity figures that we would normally see at this time of year. So we're making some gains, but we are very short on the numbers of patients that we'd normally expect to be seeing. And what worries us most about that is that those are our most curable patients. These are the patients that we can cure most easily with surgery and limited adjuvant therapies. And I hope that when we do see those patients, we can still offer them curative therapy but it's likely that the burden of adjuvant therapies that we need to offer them uh, may well be higher. We may need to need because they're at a more advanced stage. Dr. Grelo, maybe turning to you and a, a similar question, I'd be interested in, in your perspective on what are you seeing within your clinical practice and, and what's your view on some of the consequences if we don't see a change in some of these trends? In Seattle, we had probably a a six to eight week period where we really shut down our routine screening mammography. None of us had any idea that this pandemic was going to last this long. Seven plus months later, um, we are realizing that we're just going to have to live with the, the new normal and we're at hundred percent capacity now, but we know we missed people and we know we need to catch up. And uh, you know, we're estimating thousands of extra deaths in the U.S., and it will be spread out over many years. So I think the message is early detection saves lives, no matter how you detect it. If you feel something abnormal, if there's something abnormal, come in. We'll make it safe for you. And, and keep up with your screening, and um, let's try to figure out how to make that safe, too. I mean, I think, Delith, my understanding is, is that within breast cancer now, you've launched the Press Play campaign and that that's a campaign specifically aimed at really trying to create some of the patient activism that in some respects, Dr. Grelo is speaking to. Could you tell us a little bit more about that campaign? It's been really important for us to um, gather what we can in terms of patient experience to inform our uh, influencing work because what we wanted wanted to do was to really try and get across to the decision makers and the the, the policy makers that the genuine impact that um, the pandemic was having on people affected by breast cancer now the incredible range of experience from you know some people having their their treatments paused some people having uh, you know really significant changes not very well explained and then of course you've got all the concerns around screening so what we're trying to do is get people to face up to the fact that this isn't going away and we've got to invest in the workforce and get the you know the services as operational and up to full capacity as possible. I guess one of the 
if you will, optimistic things that I've been able to find out of a number of these conversations is that there are some changes that are positive ones that result in improvement in either care or improvement in patient experience. Is there anything that sort of rises to the top for you as a result of, of wrestling with the pandemic? I, I think um, for us as a charity, for example, we provide face-to-face -face support services for people going through their, you know, their treatment and also a kind of post-treatment, get back to life support uh, services. Now, all of those have gone online and they, they've actually worked really, really well and they've been rated quite highly, even in older age where the assumption is that, you know, women over the age of 70 won't use an iPad. So, you know, if th there's that little bit of innovation has been really encouraging because that helps us with reach. Same question to you, Dr. Simcock, uh, just interested. Any any silver linings or, or, or changes for the positive that you're, you're happy to see um, have been ushered in? I guess for me, it's something about the decentralization of healthcare, the way that we made the hospital the hub of all of the secondary cancer care for patients. And we've worked very hard, very quickly to change that. And I think that's to the good for patients. Uh, why should they take a whole morning off work to spend 15 minutes to talk to me? I've had some extraordinary conversations. I, I rang a patient the other day and I said, are you outdoors? I, it sounds like you're outdoors somewhere. She said, I'm actually riding my horse. And the thought that you could have a consultation with a patient where she could be embracing life fully and not have to interrupt that to check in with me, I thought was just absolutely wonderful. And this has suddenly enabled that in a way that uh, we were very slow to do previously. Uh, the PP has gone on, but the red tape has gone off. And suddenly we've been able to move forward in service innovations at, at a speed I have never seen before in our healthcare system. Uh, Dr. Grayla, same question to you. We are the medical school for five states, essentially. Um, and uh, so our patients come from a long distance and the telemedicine really why weren't we doing it before? There were regulatory issues, there were licensure issues, there were, you know, there were billing issues, you wouldn't get the same compensation for your time. But somehow we were able to solve all that quite quickly. Um, some of it is just waivers during the pandemic and we'll have to address it when the pandemic ends, but we're not gonna go backwards, we're not. We had a couple of patients, newly diagnosed patients who lived in nursing homes. And at that point, they weren't allowing anybody in or out. And so we did telemedicine visits. And I remember a couple of visits where, you know, the, the patient had her dog on her lap while we were talking about her new diagnosis of breast cancer. And, and, and you know, just thought how comforting that would be if during the stressful first visit with your oncology team, you could have your pet sitting in your lap while you're talking about it. So telemedicine's here to stay. I wanna turn now to our second topic and, and, and speak about the unmet need that remains within breast cancer. Dr. Graylow, for you, where do you see as some of the greatest areas of unmet need that you're the most focused in on and are any of those areas that you are more enthusiastic that we've got some interesting things on the horizon? Every tumor's different, every patient's different, every drug is different. So we are, are now at a point where we're really individualizing. Um, I happen to practice you know, at a state-of-the-art facility. I mean, if we could take what we know about you know, diagnosis and treatment and supportive care and what many people at my center are getting right now, and we could translate around the that around the world, we'd be saving tens if not hundreds of thousands of lives tomorrow. So we've got a lot of unmet needs. Dr. Simcock, to you, I'd, I'd be interested in, in your reflections on the same question. Are there particular uh, areas of disparity that you think are, are, are the most important for us to be aware of? So in terms of unmet need, I think we can, we can talk about biological differences and how we classify cancers. We currently have a wealth of opportunities to treat patients with estrogen receptor positive and HR2 positive disease and triple negative despite advances in new therapies remains the area where we have a limited uh, arsenal to draw from. So I, I think in terms of biological differences of cancer, triple negative disease is still an area where it would be an obvious focus. And then another, I think, good problem to have 
is the group of patients who have treatable but not curable disease. I think we need to do more work at how we, well, there's a lot of literature on the fear of recurrence for the early, for the patient treated with early disease, but we don't have the same sort of literature about how we help patients with uh, incurable but well-managed disease uh, manage fear of progression and relapse and death. Well, I think we get, certainly get a lot of very good insights from a clinical and research perspective in terms of what matters and where the unmet needs are. What matters most to patients as it relates to the unmet need question that I just posed the two doctors? The point about patients being individuals um, and really listening to what matters to them applies you know, wherever you are in your, your journey, whether you're, you're older or not. One of the things that I, I think we hear about so much for patients who have metastatic disease, secondary breast cancer, the terminology, you know, incurable but treatable breast cancer, it's really, it's not helpful because there isn't a great phrase that covers everybody. And then, of course, the other thing then is access to new and emerging treatments through clinical trials and speedy access to to, to new treatments and so so those are the those are the kind of unmet needs on my last topic i just want to turn to innovations in breast cancer and dr simcock what do you think the future of breast cancer screening and diagnosis looks like if you put on your your futurist lens and and think about kind of what could be possible well uh we were running in the UK uh, an age extension trial for uh, screening. So the screening age in the UK is uh, from age 50 to 70. The age exit screening trial was looking at extending that downwards from 47 and up to 72. Sadly, uh, the COVID catch up has meant that that trial is on pause. So, I, But I think that trial will gather pace. Uh, and I think we, with the advent of digital uh, screening, AI might just come to the rescue of screening and allow us to upscale that and despite radiological shortfalls. Dr. Grail, I'd be interested in your perspectives on those same questions around the future of screening. What's been seen by public as our disagreement about what age to start and how often to do it and what age to stop has confused a lot of people to the point where they say, oh, you can't agree and you've confused me. The key point is coming in early, whether it's a lump that you feel or if it's detected through screening is what's important and what saves lives. So we've got to you know, use the resources of having um, peers uh, and patient navigators and all help get patients through the system once they are diagnosed and try to understand what the barriers are to getting treatment quickly. Again, how do you see sort of the role of biomarker testing and where it where it's going to be going moving forward as a way to advance our ability to um, combat this disease? Biomarkers are critical, and um, they're more and more and more. Um, you know, we're we're relying on them to tell us what is the optimal treatment for this given patient and this given cancer, and uh, we just have to make them cheaper and easier and reproducible um, so that everybody can have access to them. And then make sure we can tie that to getting access to the drugs that they're telling us will probably work. Della, do you feel that patients have a, a, a reasonably good understanding of the role of biomarker testing? Is there more that we can and that we need to be doing as it pertains to education around biomarkers and, and the importance that that plays? So we know that uptake of screening in the UK has been drifting downwards for quite a long time. And um, the uptake of screening by people from black and minority ethnic communities is, is lower. I would like us to be making absolutely the very best of what we've got at the moment, but also trying to prepare for the next stage, which is where we can identify um, individuals risk of breast cancer and give them options and advice about how to respond to that risk. Well, I really appreciate that. We've, 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 we've covered a lot of ground in the time that we've had together. Thank you all for joining us here today. It's very, very much appreciated. And uh, I thank you all also for the work that you're doing on behalf of patients around the globe and within your local communities. Thanks again and take care.